Welcome to this Children in Northern Ireland professional briefing. My name is Kieran Trainer, and this is one of a series of briefings from Children in Northern Ireland. The purpose of these briefings is to inform practice in voluntary and community family and child care services in Northern Ireland. The title of this briefing is What is Child Abuse? This is a sensitive subject for an audience of professionals working with children and young people. It is not intended to cause concern or anxiety. Should this information raise questions or feelings for you, there are a list of contacts at the end that may be useful. We start with the legislation regarding children in Northern Ireland. The law clearly states that the welfare of the child is paramount. What we mean by that is that it should be and is our most important consideration. In our decisions and actions regarding children, the welfare of the child should be topmost in our list of priorities. The action we take to promote the welfare of children and protect them from harm is everybody's responsibility. Anyone and everyone who comes into contact with children and young people and families has a role to play. The more we work together, the better for our children and young people. Children and young people that come into contact with lots of people during the day, during the week, during the month, schools, peers, friends, family members, professionals in health and social care. All of those people will see children in different ways and will have information about those children. It's working together to share information and to act for the welfare of children that we can best protect children. Let's look at what child abuse is. Child abuse is when a child has experienced, is experiencing, or may experience harm. So it's something that has happened to a child, is currently happening to a child, or may happen to a child in the future. And it's where that harm is significant. And we'll talk about significance in a moment or two. That the harm may be to do with something done to the child, so an act of commission, someone has committed something, or something not done to the child, something that has been omitted. For example, a child not getting food, not getting medical treatment that causes harm to that child. Harm can be to do with the negative impact on physical and mental health. So something has happened to the child that has a negative physical impact, like an injury. Or harm can also be to do with the negative impact on a child's development. So a child is not getting the proper nourishment, they may not develop or meet their developmental milestones the way we would expect. Harm could come from a single event, a pattern of events, and can happen over time within a child's life. Who abuses children and young people? It could be a person the child knows or does not know. So we often talk to our children about stranger danger, but often the abuse happens from someone the child knows. It could be a person or persons in the real world who has contact with the child, someone they meet on a day-to-day basis in the real world. Or it could be someone online, via social media or gaming. Someone the child has never met, but has a relationship with online. It could be a single person, or it could be more than one person. It could be a group of people who know each other, or have contact with each other. It could be an adult, or it could be another child or young person. It is important to remember that abusers do not conform to stereotypes. So what would make harm significant? Some things to think about. The harm is or the behavior is unreasonable. It's not what would be expected or wanted for a child. If we think about what we would want for the children in our care of the children we work with, what is happening to this child is not what we would want. We would consider that unreasonable. Or it's serious. It's beyond what we would consider to be normal or acceptable. It is serious. We should also consider in terms of significance the impact on the health and well-being of the individual child. So this individual child is being affected by this behavior in terms of their health and well-being. We need to think about severity. How severe is this action? The degree, how much, the intensity, the extent, how long it goes on for, the duration, and how often the frequency of the event. So if we take, for example, hitting a child, how hard has the child been hit? How much injury was caused? How often did it happen? How long did it go on for? We should also consider the intention. Was it the intention of the person to hurt the child? Or maybe this was an accident? And was it premeditated? Had the person planned to hurt the child? We may also consider history. Is there a pattern here? And finally, we should consider the characteristics of the child and those involved. For example, 
a smaller child, maybe an ill child, may be more impacted by the behavior of an adult than a more robust or older or healthier child. So what are the characteristics of the child and also the characteristics of the alleged abuser? It is very important to remember that those of us who work in the voluntary and community sector have a particular role when it comes to protecting children. It is not our job to decide that abuse has happened or that harm is significant. It's important we are aware of what makes harm significant, but we will not make that decision. It will be social services, the police, the courts who make that decision. It is our job to report our concerns to social services or the police. So if we think harm is happening to a child and we think that harm is serious or significant or severe, then we report that to social services or the police. In Northern Ireland, we consider there to be five forms of abuse. Neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and exploitation. Let's have a look at each of them. In terms of physical abuse, the key word is deliberate. It's deliberately physically hurting a child. It can take a variety of forms and a variety of different methods, including hitting, biting, pinching, shaking, throwing, burning, scalding, drowning, or suffocating a child. It's important to remember this is not accidental injury. It is deliberate, deliberate physical harm to a child. Neglect is the failure to provide for a child's basic needs. If we think of a child's needs as physical needs, in terms of exercise, food, etc., intellectual needs like stimulation in school, emotional needs like emotional nourishment, hugs, being told they're loved, and social needs, mixing with others, for example. And if those basic needs are not being met, whether it be the inadequate food, clothing, poor hygiene, a poor level of supervision or shelter, and if that is likely to result in serious impairment of a child's health or development, then that would count as neglect. And it's important to remember that children who are neglected often also suffer from other types of abuse. So neglect may not be missing an occasional meal, but it may be a pattern of missing meals that has an impact or a serious impairment on the child's health or development. Emotional, or sometimes called psychological abuse, is the persistent emotional maltreatment of a child. Persistent emotional maltreatment of a child. It can have severe and persistent adverse effects on a child's emotional development. So something is happening to a child that is undermining their self-esteem, their sense of self, their confidence, their resilience, their ability to cope. And that may involve deliberately telling a child that they are worthless, unloved, inadequate, putting the child down, or indeed having too high expectations of a child that they can never meet. So the child feels like a failure, feels like a disappointment or not giving a child opportunities to express their views so the child hasn't got a voice, or deliberately silence them, making fun of what they say or how they communicate. Bullying, including online bullying through social networks, social media, online games, or mobile phones could also be considered emotional abuse. And there may be others that you think about. Sexual abuse is using or exploiting children sexually for someone else's gratification or gain or the gratification of others. It may involve physical contact, including assault by penetration, for example, through oral sex or rape, but it can also include non-penetrative acts, such as masturbation, kissing, rubbing, touching outside the clothing. And it can include non-contact activities, such as involving a child in the production of sexual images, forcing them to look at sexual images or watch sexual activities, encouraging them to behave in sexually inappropriate ways, or grooming a child in preparation for abuse. And that can include online grooming. Sexual abuse is not solely perpetrated by adult males. Women and other children also see sexually abused children. Consent plays a big part in our discussions of sexual abuse. Consent involves a choice and having the freedom and capacity to make that choice. In Northern Ireland, the legal age of consent is 16 years of age. A child under 13 years of age cannot ever consent to sexual activity. And if we have concerns that a child under 13 is engaged in sexual activity, we must report that to the police. It is also an offence for an adult to have any sexual activity with someone below 18 years of age if that adult is in a position of trust. 
So the age of consent rises to 18 where someone is in a position of trust. It's important to remember that the age of consent at 16 applies to children irrespective of sexual orientation. Exploitation is the intentional ill-treatment, manipulation or abuse of power and control over a child or young person to take selfish or unfair advantage of a young person for personal gain. It's a manipulation and exploitation of a child and that may be for financial gain, sexual gain. It can involve child labour, slavery, servitude, engaging a child in criminal activity, engaging a child in begging, benefit fraud or other financial fraud and indeed can involve trafficking. Trafficking is illegal and the movement of a child from one place to another place for the purposes of exploitation is a criminal offence. Exploitation extends to the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbouring or receipt of children for the purposes of exploitation. And child sexual exploitation is also something of concern. You may have concerns about a child or young person's welfare and it may have something you have seen heard, been told, read, smelled. We pick up information from a child that causes us concern. And that may be to do with worrying remarks a child or others has made, have made. It could be sudden, unexplained or worrying changes in behaviour. So you have noticed something that causes you concern. The outgoing and confident child becomes silent and quiet. The silent and quiet child becomes out going and confident. Something has happened in the child's life that has triggered that change in behaviour. That something could be positive or it could be something that negatively affects the child's welfare. There may be physical signs and marks on the child that cause you concern. Bruises, injuries, some of those injuries may be caused by themselves, which we call self-harming. And self-harming may be an indicator that something is not right in the child's life. A lot of self-harming behavior is an expression of how the child feels. And we need to ask the question, why does that child feel that way so that they are harming themselves in order to cope with those feelings? There could be changes in personal hygiene. Now we know that some children will fluctuate in their personal hygiene and we will all have stories, for example, of teenage boys who go to their rooms uh, and deteriorate in terms of their hygiene. But will those changes in hygiene have an impact on the child's welfare are a result of other things impacting on the child's welfare, then we should be concerned. There may be unexplained or repeated injuries for where the explanation does not fit. A child with an injury and when you ask them where that injury came from, the story doesn't fit the injury. Threats of suicide are a particular concern. If a child is seeking to act on a, on a feeling of suicide, then we need to act very quickly. We need to take all threats of suicide seriously. Or there may be concerning people in the child's life. People we know or are uncomfortable with involved with the child, then that may be a concern for the child's welfare. Or we could have a situation where a child is exposed to the potential risk of harm. A child tells us that they're in the house on their own all weekend. There is the potential risk of harm there. A child who has difficulty in making friends or a child who lacks the skills in socialising. Well, sometimes that can be a consequence of the child feeling that they are dirty or maybe that this is a child who has been emotionally abused. Maybe this child has inappropriate sexual awareness, behaviour or language. They know things and they behave in ways that are inappropriate for their age and stage of development. That may cause us concern. Or maybe this is a child who is distrustful of adults. Or alternatively, a child who is excessively attached to adults. This child has learned behaviours to attach to adults that may cause us concern. Or the child has produced worrying drawings or stories. So the child has drawn a house and one of the bedroom windows is shaded out. Well, the child is communicating something there that we need to pay attention to. And there may be other behaviours or productions or stories from the child that cause you concern. It is important if you have concerns about something that a child has said or something you have seen, something you've heard or been told, something you've read maybe through your records or report or indeed something you've smelled, changes in hygiene, drug use for example. It is really important we share that. And for those of us who work in the voluntary and community childcare sector, we share that initially with the designated person in the organisation we're working within. That person may be called the designated child protection officer 
the designated officer, the safeguarding officer, whoever it is, it's important for you to know who they are because they are the person you report your concerns to. You can also report your concerns to social services through your designated officer or directly yourself. And indeed, in the case of criminality, we could report to the police. It's important to remember that it is difficult to report. Sometimes we may have loyalties that we don't want to breach, but it's very important to remember that the welfare of the child is paramount. It is our most important consideration and it is okay to be wrong, but it is not okay not to share. It is not okay to keep secrets or keep confidences that may threaten the welfare of the children we work with or the children in our care. There are lots of resources that we can use to help us in our decision making, such as our designated officers. But on the slide here, we have a list of contacts. We have the phone numbers of all of the health and social care trusts who will host the gateway teams, who will be the people we will report our concerns about child protection to. Outside of office hours, we have the Regional Emergency Social Work Service. We have the Police Service, the NSPCC, Lifeline, Childline and Parentline and Family Support Northern Ireland. If you have any questions or want to undertake future training or see the resources we have available, please check out our Children in Northern Ireland website. We hope you got a lot from this professional briefing and check out some of our other briefings. Thank you very much. Thank you.